Hi everybody. In this video, I'd like to go over some of the main points of Rene Descartes' Meditations on First Philosophy. I will share the screen with you now. There we go. Let's see here. I use my little red dot there. Now for my Marywood students, you can find some reading questions right under the link for this video. Note that these are reading questions that may not all be covered by this video, uh, but you will have to do the reading in order to uh, answer them all. But I'm hoping that this video will help orient you to this very interesting and influential reading by Rene Descartes. Um, so let's get started. Descartes was a French philosopher, lived in the 17th century, 16th, 17th century. And he was a scientist, mathematician, and philosopher, and many other things as well. Uh, he liked to take naps, and he liked to philosophize while laying down. So in some ways, he's my hero. Uh, sounds like a great job. So here we go. Meditations on first philosophy. And it tells you right there in the title, which oftentimes you can tell from a title what's going to be covered in the, um, the article or excerpt or book. So we start with the first meditation. So um, I should say also one more caveat. Descartes wrote the meditations in the voice of a kind of an everyman or every person, meaning that uh, sort of a rational every person, so that Descartes thought that anyone who was capable of reasoning could reason with Descartes through this. And so he takes on the persona of a meditator. And so it's more or less conventional in philosophical circle, circles to call the uh, author of this work the meditator. So I will try to remember to do that. Sometimes I will say Descartes, um, but um, more properly, uh, we should call this or refer to the person saying these words, writing these words as the meditator. Descartes wrote the... Uh, Meditations as a kind of a six day um, retreat where he thought each day and wrote as if he was just thinking it out at the time. In fact, the ideas that went into the meditation, uh, the meditations, he were developed over his lifetime up until that point. And, uh, <clears throat> but it is a very interesting, useful literary device to. Um, write these as if they were written or and thought and written over several days. <clears throat> so I'm going to just hit some main points of the readings. Um, I think being oriented towards the readings is uh, can be very helpful, uh, sometimes more helpful than just an overview with, say, PowerPoint slides, although that has use too, absolutely. So the meditator says, I realized after thinking through for years how many false beliefs that he had, he realized that if he wanted to establish anything in the sciences that was stable and likely to last, he needed to demolish everything from the start uh, and begin again from the foundations. So his project in this, one of his big projects, or at least the sort of core of his project here, is Descartes is trying to find one absolutely certain truth. He's noticed that beliefs can often be problematic. A lot of things that we believe can be, uh, turn out to be false that we thought were true. So he wants some certainty and uh, his work in the sciences, and this is the early days of what we now know as natural science or just science, um, experimental, um, uh, ex experimental science where scientists try to gain understanding of the world <clears throat> through empirical, that is experiential, 
empirical is the uh, is sort of synonymous with experiential sciences. The empirical sciences observe, um, interact through experience with the world. <clears throat> so science, uh, I mean, Descartes is beginning to help to put together these uh, this early days of science. So he wants to get it right. He wants to find some logical foundation for the sciences that then the sciences can build on in order to create something lasting. So he says, today I have set all of my worries aside and arranged for myself a clear stretch of time. I'm here quite alone and at last I will devote myself sincerely and without holding back to demolishing my opinions. <clears throat> the meditations uh, has a lot of content, but it is maybe more than anything else, a work of epistemology uh, and a work of metaphysics. Epistemology is the area of philosophy that addresses questions about what we know and how we know it. Metaphysics is the area of philosophy that addresses questions like what is there in the world, in the universe, and uh, what kind of things are there in the world? And how do we know that uh, they are, uh, that they exist? So this is a, a primary work, one of the most influential works, especially short, short works of epistemology and metaphysics. So he tells us next how he's going to do this, why he's told us that he's going to, uh, why he's going to demolish all of his opinions. Now he's going to tell us um, how he's going to go about it. He says, all he needs for the purpose of rejecting all my opinions is to find some reason for doubt. And he's not going to go through them one by one. Rather, he's going to try to undermine the foundations. So he's going to go straight for the basic principles on which all of my former beliefs rested. And I don't know if I said Descartes there, but the meditator. So he's going to attack the kinds of ways that a person can know. So we'll see more about that in a moment. He start, he, one of the first things he addresses is talking about uh, the senses. He deals with the senses because the, this is the area where we tend to think that we know things for sure. If we can see them, smell them, touch them, uh, then we really know that something is uh, what we think it is. So he says, uh, the problem though is that we dream many times, or sometimes we dream and we think we're awake. He says, often in my dreams, I'm convinced of just such familiar events that I am sitting by the fire in my dressing gown, who has not experienced this in a dream, when in fact I am lying undressed in bed. Okay. He says he realizes that there is never any reliable way of distinguishing between being awake from being asleep. Now this is something that you should think over for yourself. Um, it's very odd. Sometimes it seems like we could pinch ourselves or something like that. Is that really true? Can we really pinch ourselves and, and no? I mean, don't we dream pinch ourselves if we're dreaming? Something to think about. <clears throat> so he can doubt things. Notice here he's beginning with what's called um, Cartesian doubt or uh, methodological doubt. He's, instead of looking for every single belief he has and trying to figure out if it's true, he tries to doubt everything that he can and, and with the purpose of if he can find even just one thing that can't be doubted, then he will know he has certain knowledge of something. So even though things that happen in dreams, sometimes they happen, seems like he's awake, he says, still it has to be admitted that the visions that come in sleep are like paintings. They must have been made as copies of real things. So at least these general kinds of things, eyes, head, hands, and the body as a whole, must be real and not imaginary. So for instance, um, universal things must uh, be known, be capable of being known. So it seems reasonable to conclude that physical things like uh, physics, astronomy, and medicine, and all other things dealing with things that have complex structures, those are doubtful, 
but he's talking about general things here, arithmetic, geometry, other studies of simple general things contain something certain and indubitable. So in other words, um, you know, three and, three and two make five, I had to think for a second. Um, you know, arithmetic, geometry, four sides in a square. These are things that even if you dream about them, he's saying um, they have to be true, right? We don't depend on them in the same way. We don't depend on our senses to tell us these things. Um, but he has said that for many years there's an all-powerful God, and he's going to say here, isn't it true that God could have brought it about to deceive me that two and three make five, that a square has four sides. He then says, well, some people would rather deny the existence of a powerful God than believe that God could deceive us. So for the sake of argument, he's going to um, say that there is no God. Of course, he's going to later go on to give a proof for the existence of God, but for the sake of argument, because... <clears throat> Um, because uh, of this sort of complication. Now, on the one hand, it seems like God would be powerful enough to be able to deceive us, but on the other hand, it seems like one of God's essential traits that God would not deceive us. He's going to set the whole thing aside, because what he's going to do is he is going to posit um, something sort of like a God. He's going to posit an evil demon. He's going to say, that an evil demon, you can imagine that there's an evil demon, and remember here, he's not saying he believes in an evil demon that's so powerful. He's not saying he doesn't believe in God. He's not crazy. He's not, he's not saying that he doesn't believe there's no sky and no bodies and all the rest. He is trying to find one thing that's absolutely indubitable, right? That's undoubtable for... Um, people that, uh, <clears throat> but anyway, undoubtable. I mean, it was, it was news to me at one point that uh, indubitable was not just a funny, make fun word. It's, it's the word for undoubtable. So an indubitable, like something that cannot be doubted, he is looking for that. That's what he's looking for. And so he's positing, he's, making, he's constructing these thought experiments to think through how it's possible that one thing could be absolutely true. Now we know, um, or we may know, that Descartes is sometimes called a rationalist. Uh, and a rationalist is someone who believes that the most certain knowledge we can have is through our reasoning, right? It's through reason, rather than our experience of the world through our senses. Now an empiricist, the word empirical comes from the same root as experience. Uh, an empiricist believes that uh, our most important experience, or I'm sorry, that uh, our most certain knowledge comes through the senses, that that's how we know the world primarily is through the senses. Now, a rationalist doesn't believe that we don't learn anything through our senses. An empiricist doesn't believe that we uh, don't learn anything through our sense of reason, at least most rationalist empiricists are that way. But these are the sort of main possibilities in epistemology or how we, um, you know, the study of how we know things. So the, the uh, epistemological rationalist believes that we have most certain knowledge through our reason. The epistemological empiricist believes that we have most certain knowledge through our um, senses. Okay, so on to the second meditation where he says he will suppose he starts back and he says, um, you know, so he's had a little rest now after the first meditation. He gets back to it. Um, he says he's going to suppose now that everything is fictitious. So he's pretending that there's an evil demon and he's going to see if he can know anything um, at all for sure if there's anything that he can not doubt, if there's an evil demon controlling his mind. Now, you can think about present day, you can think about the matrix here, uh, where people are, their minds are being controlled. You can think of an evil scientist controlling somebody's mind. Um, I would suggest not to go too far down 
thinking that Descartes is just writing the first draft of the matrix because there's a whole lot of details and a whole lot of things about the matrix that are tangential to what Descartes was after. So focusing on Descartes' project, he just wants to know one thing for absolutely sure. Now that may be something if we were in a matrix that we would want to find out as well. But um, in any case, <clears throat> so he says, so what if a supremely powerful and cunning deceiver, this evil demon, deliberately deceives me all the time? He says, well, let him deceive me all he can. He will never bring it about that I am nothing while I think I am something. So after thoroughly thinking the matter through, I conclude that this proposition, I am, I exist, must be true whenever I assert it or think it. Whenever he asserts it or think it, or thinks it. Um, in another one of his works is the more famous phrasing of this, I think, therefore, I am. And <clears throat> the idea here is that um, if you're thinking, you must exist. So the deceiver, the evil demon, can trick me as much as uh, he wants to. The fact is, if I am doubting that this evil demon exists, even if I'm doubting that I exist, if I'm, if I'm doubting that I exist, remember I've tried to doubt everything else, I'm successful at doubting everything else. If I try to doubt that I exist, I fail, because if I'm doubting, I'm thinking. And if I'm thinking, I must exist. Think about that and see if that is a powerful argument for you. Um, there was at least one philosopher that said, well, if you're thinking, it doesn't necessarily mean you exist. It means someone exists. Um, not sure about that, but something to think about. He next moves on after this. Now, no, I don't want to bury the lead here. This is the single indubitable thing that he says he can know. He can know that he exists. This is the meditator. He knows he exists because he is thinking, even if he's doubting himself, and if he's thinking, he must exist. Because if there's thinking going on, it must be because someone is doing the thinking, right? So then he moves on and says, well, what shall I say I am? Can I now claim to have any features? <sighs> Let's see where I guess I claim to have any of any of the features that I used to think belong to a body. Now remember when he says body, he's thinking of a physical thing. So he can doubt all the evidence of his senses, so he can doubt physical things. When I think about them, that is bodies very carefully, I find that they are all open to doubt. So uh, now he has to move on. So when he thinks, what is he really? Strictly speaking, he is simply a thing that thinks. There's no, there are no other uh, features or characteristics that can be attached to this presence, this, this ego. Uh, and I don't mean in the pejorative sense of ego. I just mean as an I, sort of like a, an, an inner self, just a minimal self, an I that exists and its pure function is just that it thinks. We, we don't know what it thinks about. We don't know anything about it. Uh, we don't know if it has a hat, a coat, and a, you know, a Mustang. Or, um, we don't know anything about it. It's just a thing that thinks. That's all we know. Okay, all right. So let's move ahead here. Now there are a lot of uh, important arguments along the way, but I'm just gonna give you the overview here or do my best to do so. So uh, he goes on to say, I can't help thinking that bodies are much more clearly known to me than is this puzzling eye that can't be pictured in the, in the imagination, right? You can't, you can't imagine what an eye is because it doesn't have any features. I mean, the only feature that it has is that it's, it's, it thinks. Um, so if you're thinking of a brain, no, that's not it because then you're thinking of a material stuff and he can doubt that material stuff exists and once again if he can doubt it that he's saying he's arguing that we can doubt it so he's a sort of every man he's thinking this through and he's inviting us to think through with him and see if we don't agree or see if we do agree um <clears throat> okay 
So, so he tries to understand, he wants to get a clearer grasp of things uh, that I realize, he says, I, I had a clear, let's see, uh, I'm sorry, here, let me go back. Um, it would be surprising if this were right. In other words, if he could imagine that bodies were a certain kind of thing, that, that were something that he could imagine were true. For it would be surprising if I had a clearer grasp of things and I realized that I realize are doubtful, uh, unknown or foreign to me, bodies that I have, then I have of what I, of, I'm sorry, <laughs> of murdering this, then I have of what is no, no, okay. Then I have of what is true and known, namely my own self. Remember, he knows that his self exists, but he can doubt uh, his body and bodies in general. Um, so he says, let us consider the things that people ordinarily think they understand best of all, namely the bodies that we touch and see. Now, this is the wax example. And this is making a point here that uh, reason tells us the true nature of things, not our senses. So he says, this piece of wax, for example, there, um, he says, it has everything that seems to be needed for a body to be known perfectly clearly. He says, but as he speaks these words, he brings the candle or the wax close to the fire and it changes, you know, it, its shape is lost, the size increases, the color changes, it changes and it changes in a way that, um, that he cannot imagine all of the actual changes that it could that it could take, all of the different ways, all the manifestations of changes that it could take. In other words, he could imagine many, many different forms this thing can take, but if, but he can't imagine them all. It's an, at least a relatively infinite number of uh, sensory, you know, it has, a, it has a, an infinite number of qualities that we would, have to pick up with our senses and how can we know that each time it is still the same wax and yet we know it is the same wax so he says uh, okay in knowing that the wax is changeable i understand that it can go through endlessly many changes of that kind far more than i can depict in my imagination so it isn't my imagination that gives me my grasp of the wax as flexible and changeable. Okay. I am forced to conclude that the nature of this wax isn't revealed by my imagination, but is perceived by the mind alone. So he can't know that the wax is the same wax as it goes through all of these physical changes. He must know it with the mind alone. Um, it's a, it's a heavy thought, really. Um, it's one of those, one of those heavy thoughts. He gives another example here. He says, if I look out my window, let's see, here we go. If I look out of the window and see men crossing the square, uh, I say that I see the men themselves, just as I say, I see the wax, yet do I see any more than hats and coats that could conceal robots? And the answer, of course, would be no. He only sees hats and coats. He infers that there are men inside the hats and coats, but there could be robots in there and not men. So why does he know there are men? He judges that there are men. It's through the mind, the ability of the mind to reason. That's how he picks up on it, right? He moves from perceiving sensory um, information, but his knowledge comes from what his mind does with that sensory information. Something I thought I saw with my eyes, therefore, was really grasped solely by my mind's faculty of judgment. <clears throat> okay, a lot of uh, interesting thoughts here about uh, how we know things and uh, what's real and what's true. How do we know things are true? Is it because we see them or is it because 
we take evidence through our senses and we have to form judgments that are through the mind alone. So it's not always seeing is believing. So moving on to meditation three and the last one we're gonna deal with in this, uh, in this video. He starts again here where he was. I am certain that I am a thinking thing. Now there's a few little points here. Um, he knows, he says, the first item of this knowledge is that there is a, a, a clear and distinct perception of what he's asserting. So because he knows, this, knows that this is absolutely true, that he exists, he's a thinking thing, he knows this, and the other thing he knows about it is that it's very clear and very distinct. Then he says he lays it down as a general rule that whatever he perceives very clearly and distinctly is true. <clears throat> so that's kind of a kind of a criteria or a criterion for <clears throat> how you can know that something is real and exists <clears throat> if it's clear and distinct. Okay. Then he moves on to examining his ideas and how he acquires them. They're different ideas and how he acquires them. I'm going to move past that a little bit. Um, and he talks about things that are revealed by the natural light. He calls it the natural light. Now, this is a kind of an intuition that he's talking about here. It's really just the same thing. Uh, at least it's, it's probably in uh, heavy-duty Cartesian scholarship, this may be argued. But maybe just uh, for the purposes of getting an initial grasp on it, we can think of the natural light as uh, a similar thing or the same thing as something that's clear and distinct, right? If it's something that we just know is true, something absolutely that we know is true, that we work through logic and know it. But we can, so we know it in two ways. Uh, we know that we're a self in two ways. We know, according to the meditator, we know it because we logically deduced it. Remember, we started with our senses and we worked our way down to find the most indubitable piece of knowledge we could find, the, the, the most reduced bit of uh, fact that we could find. Uh, and we know it also with the natural light. So he thinks he's got a criterion here where he can move faster than just using logic, kind of a, a, an intuition where he just knows. Um, this, by the way, is a very disputed, very controversial uh, part of Descartes' uh, work here. But as you can see, what he's trying to do is he's trying to hang together his uh, scrutiny, his inquiry into um, knowledge and truth by using a logical method, right? He's discovering all these things through a logical method. Whether you think he's successful or not, um, this is kind of critical thinking par excellence, at least the, the idea of looking for evidence for every piece of knowledge that we think we have. Um, things that are revealed by the natural light, like uh, if I'm doubting I exist, are not open to any doubt, right? That's, that's what it means to be um, knowing things by the natural light. Now we'll conclude on just two more points, and that is about God. Now this is a very strange point here. Um, I think intuitively it might make sense though. Uh, now he says it is obvious by the natural light, so he's using that criterion now for how he knows things uh, without moving through uh, lots of stages of logic. Now it is obvious by the natural light that the total cause of something must contain at least as much reality as does the effect, right? So something is just as real as if it's the cause of a thing. Now I'll do a spoiler here for you. Where he's going with this is that if something caused, uh, you know, if you're trying to prove the existence of something and, the, and there's an effect, then what he's saying here is that if there's a real thing, then there must have been something real that caused it. So this is how he's going to work backwards from 
uh, or one of the ways he's going to work backwards from the existence that he knows for sure that I exist, I'm not me, Phil Jenkins, but I, you know, that an I exists in each and every one of us, right? But for the meditator, you know, he knows indubitably that he exists. So this I, this thinking thing must come from somewhere. And there must be just as much reality is the way he puts it in that thing as there is in this I. So he knows there's reality in this I. So there must be at least that much and probably more in whatever caused it. See where this is going? So it's going to be God, right? The, the big G right there. So now it is obvious by the natural light that the total cause of something must contain at least as much reality as the effect. For where could the effect get its reality from if not from the cause? Uh, see? And how could the cause give reality to the effect unless it first had that reality itself. Two things follow from this, that something can arise from nothing, right? So if you're looking at an object, you're looking at something, an entity, whether it's a, a loaf of bread or um, um, a black hole, or, well, I don't know, I guess you can't really look at those, at least not yet, um, you know, a house or a pineapple or, you know, yourself, if you're looking at that, it couldn't have come from nowhere. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, let's see, that something can't arise from nothing and that what is more perfect can't arise from what is less perfect. Okay, so, right here, so... Moving on here, among my ideas, he says, apart from the one that gives me a representation of myself, just means apart from uh, the idea he has of his self, his I. Um, there are ideas that he has variously of God. He has an idea of God. He has an idea of inanimate bodies, uh, angels, animals, and other men, okay? Other people. As regards my ideas of men, animals, and angels, I can easily understand that they could be put together from the ideas I have of myself. So he's trying to figure out how he knows that there are these other things. And he's saying that the way that he can imagine, uh, well, maybe imagine is kind of problematic, but he logically deduces that his knowledge of animals or angels or other people could have been constructed in his mind from ideas that he has about himself, right? Bodies in general or God. So he can derive, right? He can, he can take from, he can derive ideas of those things from ideas of himself. And finally, <clears throat> excuse me, um, there remains only the idea of God. Is there anything in that which couldn't have originated in myself? And now here's where the rubber hits the road for his, uh, at least one of his arguments for the existence of God. By the word God, I understand a substance that is infinite, eternal, unchangeable, independent, supremely intelligent, and so on. Uh, the more carefully I concentrate on these attributes, the less possible it seems that any of them could have originated from me alone. So this whole discussion implies that God necessarily exists. So just think, think about that for a moment, that he, the meditator, could not have um, come up with these ideas that were more perfect than he is. They must come from somewhere more perfect that has more reality than he does. And so the only place he thinks that can come from uh, must be God. And so the implication here um, is, an uh, implication is where if one thing is true, the other thing has to be true. You know, A implies B if uh, it's the fact that if A is true, then B has to be true. So this is what he's saying is, uh, shows that God necessarily exists. Um, it's not possible that any of these ideas could have originated from him alone because of reality, because of perfection. Um, he's just not the kind of being that could 
uh, come up with these on his own because he's not perfect. It's it's almost like it's sort of a, sim a simplistic argument about uh, like this would be, I have an idea of perfection in my mind. The idea couldn't have originated in, in a finite mind. Uh, let, let me back up. Um, I have the concept of infinity, uh, of infiniteness, and yet my body, me, I am finite. So therefore, the idea I have of infinity must come from a being that's greater than me. This is actually uh, a platonic um, argument, a platonic position from Plato, who was also, uh, well, I shouldn't say also, maybe the original or one of the, one of the early um, rationalists. So uh, rationalism, the idea that we have more important knowledge that we gain through our reason, and Descartes is certainly uh, one of the few, um, not one of the few, sorry, let me change that, Descartes, very famous rationalist, um, and argued for the existence of the self, argued for the existence of God, uh, since argue existence for innate ideas. We have these ideas innately, we're sort of born with them. Did I say born with them? <laughs> we are born with them. And he thought that this idea of ourself, uh, he says, otherwise, is sort of the mark of the craftsman. So the craftsman, like a craftsman makes little mark on everything she or he produces. The uh, God is the craftsman that makes a little mark on us. And uh, I think we're going to leave it there. So thank you very much for listening. And uh, until next time, bye-bye.